some of them were lovers. Captain Kirk, I loved him. I loved his fire. Captain Kirk's chiffon-clad beauties were my first foray into erotica, and they were just so gorgeous and beautiful and otherworldly. It stays with me still. <laughs> Some were geniuses of diplomacy. Picard was a rock star. This is a guy who can talk his way out of any situation. Oh, no, I know Hamlet. And what he might say with irony, I say with conviction. What a piece of work is man. Some didn't mince words. I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Captain Sisko. Even his good friends can easily be intimidated by the Sisko stare. You came here for advice from a friend, and that's exactly what you're getting. They would stop at nothing. Once you had to throw all reason out the window, she was the one with the samurai sword. Come on, come on. And that's what I think defined Catherine Janeway. She'll stare you down. She'll call your bluff. And if she needs to use those guns, she knows how to use them. One more torpedo ought to do it. Captain. Fire. Some would go to any length to complete their mission. Captain Archer. He was the Han Solo Federation fleet, and he wasn't frightened to getting into a scrap in a dogfight. I said you're an ugly And life or death risk? Well, that was just part of the job. The new Kirk is an interesting take on the character. Uh, in a word, he's a punk, but he's a punk with potential. I don't know where he gets the strength to sit down in that chair. Either we're going down, or they are. Kirk out. They were the Starfleet captains, the special men and one woman who had the right stuff to claim the most powerful seat in sci-fi. In over 700 hours of television and 11 movies, the Star Trek captains were called on to explore the unknown, save the day, protect their crew, and sometimes even go down with the ship. Kirk, Picard, Cisco, Janeway, Archer and Kirk 2.0, all battle-tested and fan-approved. These are the captains of the final frontier. What does it take to call the shots on a Starfleet vessel? We ask the experts. I've noticed that most Star Trek actors are cast because of three things. They have to have interesting hair, and no hair counts. And if their hair is not that interesting, they wig you. The producers are hair obsessed. I don't know what it is. The producers were constantly tampering with Kate's hair during the show. It became somewhat of a joke. See me? I'm patting it down, hoping against hope. That's just reptilian. That was Pavlovian. Patting it down, don't come and get me. You have to have a good voice, and you have to have a good butt. You're not going to look good in a Starfleet outfit if you don't have a nice tush, whether you're a man or a woman. Hair, voice, butt. Not necessarily in that order. Well, clearly what makes a good Star Trek captain is a good tush, good hair, <laughs> and a good voice. Thank you, Mr. Picardo. And we're exploring it all, from developing the character on paper to casting the perfect actor to the moments that define them as leaders and lovers. Oh, captain Kirk was suave. He had a flicker in the eye, for sure. I admired Captain Kirk because he got a lot of action. Thought it was good to be in a position of authority and still get nooky. Each progressive captain got less nooky. They even gave up the idea of nooky, I think, at a certain point and just had a dog. We'll see the captains at battle stations. Picard didn't feel the heat of battle. He was just too cool. In battle, she's absolutely fearless. She's a gunslinger. And watch them battle their inner demons from Picard's assimilation into the Borg. He became a puppet, essentially, and that was the worst nightmare for any starship captain. To Janeway marooning her crew 70,000 light years from home. She was in probably one of the most extreme situations of any Starfleet captain. Voyager is on their own. There's no backup. There's no help coming. Plus, we'll compare the captains side by side by side. Who's the deadliest? Who's the dreamiest? Who's delivered the most beatings? And who's bedded the most heavenly bodies? Find out over the next two hours as we ride shotgun with the greatest heroes of Starfleet Command, beginning with the man who started it all, Captain Kirk. Engage.
Why was he so iconic? Because Jim Kirk could do anything. Captain Kirk was just the guy. He had sex appeal and charisma. You were in good hands with Captain Kirk. To many fans, Captain James T. Kirk is synonymous with Star Trek. But when the USS Enterprise launched for the first time, Kirk was nowhere in sight. In 1963, former bomber pilot and L.A. street cop turned TV writer Gene Roddenberry trotted out an intriguing idea for a new television series. The premise of the original series was Wagon Train to the Stars. It was about a strong leader leading a band of, of explorers out into the unknown, into the wilderness, and encountering jeopardy and adventure. But in this case, the frontier would be the final frontier, space. And this wouldn't be your ordinary sci-fi shoot-'em-up. Roddenberry's series would also be a platform for ideas. My father had seen the world. He had seen the worst of humanity, and he'd seen the best. And he wasn't just your average writer, he was definitely a philosopher. He was really limited by doing cop shows, you know, and Western shows. You can only do so much. The stories he wants to tell keep getting censored. He's thinking this is, you know, these are great ideas, you know, racism, economic problems, social problems. So he thinks if I can do a science fiction show, talk about serious things, but if I put green skin women and rocket ships and lasers, then the censors won't know that I'm really being serious about some things. But my audience that I know is smarter than these suits, they'll get it. They'll see through and we'll all have a big secret together. And that's what happened. But the difference between a ship of fools and a vessel of peace would be a strong and virtuous captain. And Roddenberry based his Starfleet commander on a famous hero of fiction. Gene took his model for his Starfleet captain from Horatio Hornblower, from E.F. Forrester's uh, British naval stories. He's cut off from his command base. He's got to make a lot of decisions on his own. He's got to be part soldier, part diplomat. No time for women. His command was his mistress. His ship was his mistress, and his crew was his, you know, heavy burden to bear. CBS turned down Gene's pitch in favor of their own series, Lost in Space. But one network saw promise in his vision of the 23rd century. In 1964, NBC gave Roddenberry a tidy half mill to shoot the pilot episode. The show was sold with the captain's name being Robert April. It was uh, Captain Winter for a while, wound up being Christopher Pike for the first pilot. In the role of his first captain, Roddenberry tapped not William Shatner, but screen actor Jeffrey Hunter. Jeff Hunter played Captain Pike was very uh, stiff upper lipped, very steely eyed, strong jawed kind of a guy. The original Star Trek pilot, which was the cage, you're introduced to a captain who is at the end of his rope uh, career wise. He's ready to pack it in. He's had enough. Because he had this inner conflict about whether or not to stay, um, was, a, was a more tortured soul. Oh, I've, I've had it, Phil. To the point of finally taking my advice, arrest leave. To the point of considering resigning. Serving under Captain Pike were his first officer, a glacial beauty known as Number One, and the Vulcan science officer, Spock. Captain Pike, for most of the episode, he's kind of a very grim personality in a lot of ways. Not exactly what the studio was hoping for in terms of a lead character. When Gene delivered the pilot episode of Star Trek to the network in 1965, the response was positive, mostly. Gene spends all that money, all those heartaches, all those late hours. They have a great screening. The studio loves it, the network loves it, but they say that it's too cerebral. It wasn't action-oriented enough, and they didn't think the audiences would buy a woman as a second-in-command. They also had problems with the alien character, Spock, you know, who's the guy with the pointed ears and the green complexion. Caught between his vision for the series and the realities of a network hierarchy, Roddenberry struck a compromise in the hope of producing a second pilot. He wanted to have an alien on the bridge. He wanted to show a future in which humans were getting along with other alien species, and Spock was integral to that idea, that message. He knew in order to get the second pilot, he would have to make a tough call. He went back and he said, I insist on having Spock, but we'll take the woman off the show, and I'll marry her to make it up to her.
Commission. But the regime change didn't end there. Executives at NBC wanted to revamp the role of the captain. I thought Jeffrey Hunter was incredibly charismatic, but in a very different kind of way. The studios at the time expected their male lead to be heroic, dashing, very much a ladies' man, very much a man's man. James West on The Wild Wild West is another model that comes to mind. They enjoyed having the women. They enjoyed having the daring do, the stunts, the fights. And it was American TV. You had to have your action adventure. Gene Roddenberry and his team had to go back to the drawing board, rethink uh, the uh, crew makeup, and come up with new characters. For his efforts, Roddenberry was well rewarded. They did something that they'd never done before, apparently, and they said, you know what, but we're going to give you a second chance. They gave him the money to shoot a second pilot. With an additional $300,000, or $2 million in today's terms, Roddenberry and his team took another crack at the final frontier. But there was a problem. Their star wasn't on board for another maiden voyage. Jeffrey Hunter saw himself more as a movie star than a TV star, so going forward was just not possible, which resulted in the recasting. The first problem, what to call the swashbuckling new captain of the Enterprise, and it wasn't easy. Gene submitted a list of 16 names to the network. You can't underestimate the importance of the captain's name. Got to be something strong, gets the message across. Captain Hannibal, Captain Boone, Captain, uh, you name it. All kinds of heroic sounding names, and they wound up with Kirk. But Kirk was just a name, and now they had to find an actor charismatic enough to fill those shiny boots. Jack Lord tried out for Kirk, and while the producers may have liked the performance, there was something a little bit lacking. It wasn't swashbuckler enough. One performer did have the right stuff for Starfleet Command, a journeyman actor from the Great White North. William Shatner was a Canadian actor who'd done things like Judgment at Nuremberg and The Brothers Karamazov and The Twilight Zone. William Shatner was assertive. Here he was telling the creator, Janine Roddenberry, he had a few ideas for the character. And uh, Roddenberry, listening to the man, you know, aware of his work, was impressed and looked at him and said, I have my captain. Shatner was born to play Captain Kirk. His eagerness, his enthusiasm, is the chief characteristic that he brings to Kirk. I mean, this was the era of NASA and Wright stuff, and the, and the JFK were going to the moon years. And there was nothing America couldn't do. He wanted his captain, he wanted the mood of the show to be a real gung-ho, upbeat. We're going to go out and see what's out there. And starting in September of 1966, Viewers from the swinging 60s were about to find out what the sexual revolution would look like in the 23rd century. I'm a hot babe out jogging. I'm not making sure this stays a 10 when you drive by. You're checking out my awesome headband when... Oops. That's when you find out your cut rate insurance, it ain't paying for this. So get all state. Save cash and be better protected from mayhem, like me. Dollar for dollar, nobody protects you from mayhem like Allstate. Lots of anti-aging makeups promise results, but this one has five ingredients to prove it. L'Oreal's new Visible Lift Age Reversing Makeup. Luminous foundation with a serum of five anti-aging ingredients, you'll see five beautiful benefits. L'Oreal's new Visible Lift Makeup. You'd never wash your dishes in a dirty sink, so why use a dirty dishwasher? Hidden dirt can build up. For flawless results, use finished dishwasher cleaner to remove grease and lime scale. And a cleaner dishwasher means amazing dishes. Finish the diamond standard. This is what it's like getting an amazing discount on a hotel with Travelocity's top secret hotels. Ah. The easy way to get unpublished discounts of up to 55% off top hotels. Your fingers are quite magical. This is what it's like getting an amazing discount on a hotel with Travelocity's top secret hotels. The easy way to get unpublished discounts of up to 55% off top hotels. Purpose not included. And so the killer is... <coughs> <coughs> Coughing can really be disruptive. <coughs> That's why there's Delsum. Delsum has a time-release formula that helps silence coughs for a full 12 hours. <coughs> all day or all night. Up to twice as long as other cough liquids. So the only sounds you'll hear 
are the ones you want to hear. Constable, take her away. Delsum. Silence is relief. Applying lip balm over and over probably isn't giving results you want. Discover Neosporin Lip Health, shown to restore visibly healthier lips in just three days. Neosporin Lip Health. Rethink your lip care. Apparently, when I'm really happy about what I'm eating, I do this like... <laughs> No one can tell you where a first date will lead, but Match.com has led to more dates, more relationships, and more marriages than any other site. Join today. <laughs> Attorneys have to make some tough choices, but there's one that's easy. Oasis Legal Finance is the number one choice to provide clients the money they need for bills and living expenses long before their case may settle. Oasis has prepaid millions of dollars to people just like you, with no obligation to repay if you lose your case. I need my settlement money now, but the defendant keeps delaying the court date. After my accident, I wasn't able to work, but my attorney told me about Oasis, and they had a check to me in two days. If you're involved in a lawsuit, call Oasis Legal Finance. Get the money you deserve. Call Oasis. Call Oasis. Whether it's money for bills, rent, car payment, or groceries, call Oasis now. Remember, the phone call is free, the application is free, and there's no obligation to repay if you lose your case. Call Oasis now. In 1966, 35-year-old Canadian-born actor William Shatner landed the defining role of his career, Captain James Tiberius Kirk. Dashing, daring, and quick-witted, Kirk was just what studio executives wanted in their first Starfleet captain. Captain Kirk to me always was kind of like the 23rd century James Bond. All the guys wanted to be him and all the women wanted to be with him. He was always the one who had all the answers. But at the same time, he managed to project kind of a boyish charm and a sense of wonder about the universe. Captain Kirk, I loved him. I loved his fire. I loved everything about him because I sensed that he was a loose cannon, that he might do anything. Captain Kirk was, personally for me, the side of my father that I never got to know. Kirk was the, the cowboy. He would also be the intelligent one who took the opinions from the left and the right and then made his own assessment. And that's, I saw that in my father quite often. James Kirk, the legendary uh, cowboy captain, cowboy diplomat. He always tried to do the peaceful thing first, but when strength was necessary, he never hesitated. Audacity always, that's Kirk. Even when it looked hopeless, even when you thought there was no way out of a situation, Kirk found a way. There were occasions, God knows plenty of occasions, where he would solve the problem by punching it repeatedly in the jaw. Over the course of the original series, Kirk resorted to fisticuffs a whopping 83 times. Four of those brawls ended in death for his opponent. But in Kirk's Starfleet arsenal, an equally potent weapon was his mind. He used his brains as often as he used his brawn. His strategy is endlessly flexible. He would surrender when you weren't supposed to surrender. He would fight on when you weren't supposed to fight on. But his most valuable asset as a leader had to be complete fearlessness. I think the scene that most defines uh, Captain Kirk to me um, was from an episode called Return to Tomorrow, where he has his his command crew around him and they're making this very difficult decision. Somebody you know, said, well, it's a big chance, it's very risky. You know, should we do it? And, and Kirk says something like, risk, risk is our business. Risk is our business. That's why we're aboard this ship. And uh, that just sums up Star Trek right there. Everybody does a Kirk impression, except me, of course, I, I don't. He might make me wait one minute before he finishes his sentence. But it was always interesting, and you always felt like it was from his gut. And I guess that's what made him a good captain. You didn't think that this was someone intellectualizing leading these people. He was fully involved. Risk. Risk is our business. That's what the Starship is all about. That's why we're aboard her. And you know what's funny is at the time, that was just another speech in another show. But in this 
hindsight of history and having those 80 episodes to watch over and over again, that speech just pops out. Then there was Kirk, the lover man. The captain may have been a 23rd century guy, but in some ways, he was just another child of the 60s sexual revolution. Well, if I dare say, I mean, you know, Kirk's chiffon-clad beauties were my first foray into erotica. They were just so gorgeous and beautiful and otherworldly. It stays with me still. <laughs> L'Amour was, was part of his character, so, you know, there were plenty of scenes where he was, uh, you know, in the arms of some interesting female. You got the sense that there were great loves in his past, and then there, and there was, you know, beautiful girls in his present, but he was moving on. For all the talk and joking about Kirk's womanizing, he had a lonely life. He had two or three major loves. All of them were tragic. And that's as much a function of it being a 1960s TV show where the, the lead must always get the girl and not keep the girl. Um, you know, it's like the Bonanza syndrome where it's like you marry a Cartwright and you die by the end of the episode. The fact that he's desired by many women and committed to no one uh, makes him available for all of us to fantasize about. <laughs> And Starfleet's most eligible bachelor engaged in plenty of intergalactic relations. In the 79 original episodes, Captain Kirk locked lips with 21 women, including one android and seven aliens. But Kirk's may have been the kiss of death. 25% of these gals met an untimely death. But as Dr. McCoy often said, Kirk had only one true love, her name, was Enterprise. The Enterprise is the love of his life, and it embodies everything that he denies himself. You can also make the case that Spock is the great love of his life, and I don't mean that sexually or romantically, but Spock is there for him every time. Spock is the one that he's willing to sacrifice everything for. On the small screen, Captain Kirk was the definitive Starfleet commander, a fearless and crafty leader and a warp speed Romeo who loved and lost all across the galaxy. But it was on the big screen that James Tiberius Kirk would suffer his greatest loss. I was sitting at a table for four with a person, and I was talking to them. Actress Rebecca De Mornay. I saw two children. As I turned to them, they sort of evaporated, like they didn't want to be seen. I did not want to tell what I just saw. Celebrity Ghost Stories. All new episodes, Saturday at 9 on Bio. Which Star Trek captain was the best in battle? Answer now at Facebook.com slash bio. 150 years for every celebration that's the magic of Macy's when you're responsible for this much of the team you need a car you can count on. Be the hero of family dinner with Boston Market's all-natural rotisserie chicken, delicious sides, cornbread, and a free dessert. Just $5.99 per person. Your family feast is in the bag. Boston Market. Your table is waiting. If you hire painting, you may want to consider colors other than red, the job began with four painters, but ended with three. One guy stepped in red paint and tracked it across the living room. And after some teasing from the others, he stormed out, his red shoe leading the way. They may have finished on time and budget, but they're far from true professionals. Save money and time by hiring the right contractor first. To see reviews from consumers near you, visit Angie'sList.com today. 
Mrs. Rhodes. Turn that down. No, no, I'm here at the office. I heard you were moving your accounts to Scott Trade. <laughs> I work with a bunch of liars, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, webinario, sure. Yeah, I can make up words too. What? Oh, they have a knowledge center. That's great. I have a unicorn ranch. Scott Trade helps you take charge of your investments with an easy to use investing platform and first class customer support. Can we return the champagne? Scott Trade, get invested. While there are some home disasters you can't avoid, there is one you can. Septic system breakdowns affect 1.2 million homes each year. Septic backups can cost about $6,000 in expense and countless hours of repair. Ridex, help save yourself from disaster. When it comes to getting my family to eat breakfast, I could use all the help I can get. Like Nutella, a delicious hazelnut spread that's perfect on multi-grain toast, even whole wheat waffles, for a breakfast that my kids love and I feel good about serving. And Nutella is made with simple, quality ingredients like hazelnuts, skim milk, and a hint of cocoa. It's quick, easy, and something everyone can agree on. Nutella, breakfast never tasted this good. Tomorrow on Bio, spend an evening with The Man in Black. It's biography, Johnny Cash at 8 and Johnny Cash's America at 9, only on Bio. Get up close and personal with the world's most fascinating people. Go to bio.com slash shop for exclusive DVDs, books, and more. Real life, unfiltered. William Shatner brought the Starfleet captain to life on the small screen. But after only three seasons, in 1969, Star Trek was canceled. The original series was canceled uh, several times, actually, after the second season, and then finally for good after the third season because of ratings. Although, back in the day, they did not look at things like demographics. I don't think the show ever would have gotten canceled today, but back then it did, basically for misunderstood ratings. Die-hard fans continued to follow Captain Kirk in paperbacks, graphic novels, and reruns of the original 79 episodes. But a full decade would pass before the Star Trek faithful were rewarded with a feature film. Star Trek The Motion Picture, helmed by Oscar-winning director Robert Wise, reunited the original Enterprise crew under the command of Captain Kirk. I think Star Trek The Motion Picture failed in some extent because it didn't really reprise the spirit of the show. While the special effects may have been eye-catching and, and wonderful, they, they really did, don't have an emotional content to them the way dealing with characters and story can. Star Trek The Motion Picture wasn't a critical success, but it performed well enough at the box office to warrant a sequel. By the early 80s, a number of scripts began to circulate. There were five, count them, five drafts of what became Star Trek II. And what we did was we took things from each of those drafts and sort of cobbled them together into a new story. Writer-director Nick Meyer had been hired to bring order to the chaos of those early scripts. And he had one advantage over previous Star Trek scribes. He was never a fan. We didn't have a lot of knowledge about it. Therefore, he wasn't beholden to uh, thinking that these characters were iconic and couldn't be changed. And really, he made Kirk relatable. This was a different Kirk. This was Kirk who was off his game. This was Kirk had been promoted behind a desk. And he's bored, and he's depressed, and he's a little bit frightened. Meyer completed the script for Star Trek II in just 12 days. And the studio was delighted with the results. But there was a problem. And I got a phone call from a producer of the movie. He says, we have a real problem. Bill hates the script. And I said, he he hates it, but, but everybody loves it. I'm thinking, we're sunk. I went back to Los Angeles. Bill came in very excited and saying, this is a disaster. The disaster, in Shatner's mind, was the fresh treatment of James Tiberius Kirk. Bill wasn't ready to see his heroic captain suffer. He wanted Kirk to definitely be the hero. It was my job to ultimately convince him that a flawed hero is more interesting than a flawless hero. With a few minor script revisions, Nick prevailed. By November of 81, Bill Shatner was ready to accept an older, more vulnerable Kirk, and shooting commenced. 
But to rattle the ultimate space cowboy, Meyer would have to do the unthinkable. When the wrath of Khan hit theaters on June 4th, 1982, fans were confronted with a devastating development, the death of Spock. Kirk, as a, as a leader, his big thing, of course, was that, uh, well, he would play by the rules as long as he would win. And if it ever appeared he wasn't going to win, he changed the rules. The loss of his closest friend. This is the one scenario that he is unable to defeat. The man who didn't believe in a no-win situation was about to confront one. The wrath of Khan. Khan has been defeated, but in his last breath, he has activated the Genesis device, the most destructive weapon in the history of Starfleet, in the history of the galaxy, and it is about to go off. And the Enterprise cannot get away because it's been taking damage in this battle. The engin engineering compartment is flooded with radiation. Engineers have been dropping like flies and being dragged out. There is literally no way that a human being can walk into this room and not die before fixing the problem. The only person on board who is physically capable of doing this is Spock. And Spock's the only one who knows it. Disaster was averted, and Enterprise sped away with seconds to spare. But no one was more surprised than Captain Kirk. Kirk gets the call to come to engineering, and he turns and he sees Spock's empty chair. And the look on his face, where he knows it's bad. Spock had put the lives of the many above his own. When Spock dies and Kirk is there, to actually watch it happen. He's not able to touch Spock. He's not able to uh, offer him any comfort except through the sheet of plastic. And I liked seeing that man forced that far up against the wall. And I liked the vulnerability that Bill played it with. Live long and prosper. He's never had to deal with death on that personal a level before. He could cheat death. He could cheat anything. I mean, he'd done it, you know, every single time before it had come up. And you couldn't believe that he wasn't going to do it this time. To see, you know, uh, someone as seemingly immortal as Spock expire, and to see the pain on Kirk's face as it happened, oh, it was magic. The Kirk that Bill played in Star Trek II is about the best I ever saw him in. The death of Spock was affecting, but it was also kind of a strange rebirth for Kirk and the acceptance of life and its cycles and, and, and how important it is to accept how life comes to an end. Star Trek's success is Kirk's success, and you have to credit William Shatner with that. Shatner's Kirk is the equivalent of Connery's Bond. He is the Starfleet captain that all others will be compared to. There is no equal. But believe it or not, the toughest job in the galaxy was finding a successor for Kirk without incurring the wrath of fans. I can never describe what being possessed would feel like. It's not a friend or a coworker telling you this. You see it with your own eyes. <gasps> Did we capture a ghost? This is real, and it's on camera. My Ghost Story. Saturday at 10 on Bio. Aren't you sick of these airline credit cards that advertise flights for 25,000 miles? But when you call... Then let me check. Oh, fudge. Nothing without a big miles up charge. It's either pay their miles up charges or connect through Moose Neck. I can't feel my feet. We switched to the Venture Card from Capital One, so no more games. Let's go see those grandkids. Don't pay miles up charges. Don't play games. Get the flight you want with the Venture Card at CapitalOne.com. <laughs> What's in your wallet? <laughs> I got a little leaf on my Ancestry.com family tree. When I clicked on it, I got a hint. Then another leaf, which gave me another hint. I'm like the family detective. Visit Ancestry.com right now and discover the world's largest online family history resource. built to beat the cold. Guaranteed. Enjoy free shipping with no minimum order. 
Why wait for love? Take the first step while it's free. It's eHarmony's biggest free communication event. Now through Sunday, November 14th, review your compatible matches and start communicating using our guided communication. So try eHarmony now, free. This is Rachel, a busy mom. She starts at dawn and so does her back pain. That's two pills for a four hour drive. The drive is done, so it's a day of games and two more pills. The games are over, her pain is back. That's two more pills. And when she's finally home, but hang on, just two Aleve can keep back pain away all day with fewer pills than Tylenol. This is Rachel, who chose Aleve and two pills for a day free of pain. And get the all day pain relief of Aleve and liquid gels. You might not realize how much of your life is on your computer until it's all gone. It happens all the time. Hard drives crash, computers get lost, stolen, or hit by viruses. That's why I got Carbonite. No matter what happens to my computer, my backup's safe with Carbonite. For just $55 a year, get unlimited online backup with Carbonite. That's peace of mind for just 15 cents a day. Go to CarboniteTV.com now to try it free for 15 days. No credit card required. Plus, get two free months when you decide to buy. Start your free trial at CarboniteTV.com right now. You think your toothpaste is working? Let's find out. Come on up. What kind of toothpaste do you brush with? This shows your plaque germs. Okay. Those are germs? Yep, germ city. Oh. Now with regular toothpaste, germs start to grow back right away, and they cause most dental problems. You want to see a Colgate total mouth? Yes. See, a lot less germs, and I brushed at 7 a.m. Big difference. But Colgate total is specially formulated to fight plaque germs for 12 hours. What are you brushing with now? Definitely Colgate total. <laughs> Colgate total fights germs for 12 hours. In 1979, and again in 1982, Star Trek stormed the silver screen. The original series was a hit in syndication and even in animation. By 1984, Paramount, the studio that owned the franchise, approached creator Gene Roddenberry wanting more. Everybody loved those 79 original episodes, but after 15, 20 years, everybody knew them. Local stations want more Star Treks. They want more Star Trek. It's, it's making more and more money on its own as this poor little 20-year-old show with 79 reruns. Gene gave them a definitive no. After keeping at him for uh, a couple of years, he finally agreed. So Gene hits upon a brilliant idea. They move the timeline forward. They expand the canvas. They come up with a new crew same universe timeline they all know about Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, but it's 80 years down the line. Gene Roddenberry, he wanted to have another ship called the Enterprise. He wanted to have a captain with a French name. He wanted to have an android. He wanted to have uh, more women on the ship. He had a whole idea of what he wanted the show to be. Setting the next generation about 80 years after the original series was just genius. You get to show how the world, how the technology has evolved. The Klingons and the Federation, they're allies now. You give time for that to happen. You give time to honor the original crew, but now you've got room to develop your new cast and your new captain. Star Trek would spin off into a new series, and the most critical order of business was recruiting a new captain. Now in his 60s, Roddenberry had conceived a very different kind of Starfleet commander. Gene wanted, you know, less of the swashbuckler and more of the 24th century man of vision, man of intellect. Jacques Cousteau was the inspiration for Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Gene wanted to have a pendulum swing away from the all-American captain. He wanted to internationalize it. For the first captain, he went through so many names, they couldn't decide. He settled on Picard pretty early on Next Generation and the image of a Frenchman. First time, William Shatner wouldn't be leading the cast. But who could possibly fill the uniform like Bill? It was probably Gene Roddenberry's biggest challenge to find a new Captain Kirk, a new Bill Shatner without mimicking Bill Shatner. Roddenberry's team undertook a thorough search, and for good reason. Cast the wrong captain? and Star Trek fans would turn away in droves. Gene was transfixed on having a French captain, a French actor play this French captain, Jean-Luc Picard. They read and read and read people 
looked and looked and looked. Bob Justman, his number one producer, uh, just happened by, by just the luck one night to be with his wife at a UCLA, uh, a friend of his, had a Shakespeare class. Had a guest lecturer, performer, actor, a guy named Patrick Stewart. Patrick, of course, had done this show in the London stage, and it was something he was touring with. Bob Justman was so taken in the middle of the hunt for their captain, he turned to his wife and said, Jackie, I think we just found our captain. From that moment on, Patrick Stewart was Captain Picard. He knew in his heart he would do anything, move heaven and earth to have that happen. He talked Rick Berman into it, who had just come in as the studio producer. Gene's attitude was, you've got to be kidding. This guy is too old, he's English, and he's completely bald. This is not going to be my new James Kirk. But my attitude was, you know, what the hell? It's worth giving it a shot. And I started bugging him about reconsidering Patrick. To their surprise, Roddenberry relented. But would the studio accept a bald captain? Gene had a plan. When Patrick came and did his reading for the studio, Gene insisted that he wear a toupee. And I remember he had the toupee flown in from London. Patrick tells a great story about waiting outside the studio exec's office with his toupee in the box and chatting with the assistant there in the office. And of course, they got it out and it was horrible. We went to the office of the president of television division at Paramount and Patrick did the audition. His response afterwards was, this guy is perfect, but lose the wig, which was great. And that was the last time we saw Patrick in a toupee. The studio was sold. So was Roddenberry. The only one who wasn't convinced was Patrick Stewart. Expecting the series would be canceled or he would be canned, the actor didn't even unpack for six weeks. Rumors began to filter in that fans were not happy that there would be another Star Trek. This was their sacred cow. We completely won them over. But, you know, it didn't start that way. But seven seasons would pass before Star Trek, the next generation, would finally end. In fact, Captain Picard served twice as long as Kirk did on TV. And from the start, Picard redefined the Starfleet commander. In the original series, you never would have seen Kirk surrender the ship. That was like anathema to Kirk. When he did it in Star Trek VI, everybody turned and looked at him and went, Captain, are you, you know, are you out of your mind? In the very first episode of Next Generation, Picard surrendered the ship. Picard was not a guy whose first reaction was to mix it up. It was to let's step back and let's find the peaceful solution. Picard would rather talk than fight. He's much more reliant on diplomacy, and the kinds of adventures that were written for him actually bear that out. He was passionately devoted to reason as the guiding principle in command. That comes out in his command style. When you're watching The Measure of a Man, which is an awesome episode about Data having to defend his rights to be considered a sentient being. Captain Picard served as Data's lawyer. Uh, defending him against a scientist who wanted to take him apart and see how he worked. It's just an incredible thing to watch. He's got a booming voice that, that just reaches right through you and, and is incredibly persuasive. Gravitas. Whatever he spoke, whatever he did, you know he meant it, you know it was serious, and there was something behind it. Now tell me, Commander, what is data? I don't understand. What is he? A machine. Is he? Are you sure? Yes. You see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience, so what if he meets the third? Consciousness in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? You know, we would write to Patrick Stewart's strengths. And, you know, he had this theater background, this Shakespeare background, and allowed us sometimes to write some, some, some pretty fancy, uh, you know, <laughs> some pretty fancy rhetoric for him. But to some, this captain was a bit too intellectual. And what was going to drive, you know, the, the visceral part of the show, they created this sort of second lead in Will Riker. Basically, he fulfilled almost the Kirk role in that he's young, he's dashing, he gets the ladies. You know, he's the man of action to Picard's uh, cerebral man of thought. So they give all the old Kirk, you know, twinkle in the eye, kick <laughs> bits to Jonathan Frakes as number one. Jean-Luc didn't see much action. And sadly, he didn't get much either. 
Although suave and French, Picard was hardly a Romeo. Captain Picard is never going to rob Captain Kirk of his title as a romancer of the universe. Part of it is the real world idea that Kirk was created in the 60s and it was 60s TV. Picard was a character of the, of the 80s in the ensemble and the whole reaction away from that kind of thing. But a Starfleet captain without mojo? Patrick Stewart wouldn't have any of that. Picard has that regal Shakespearean um, center in the center seat and that's what Gene wanted. Patrick Stewart, after two or three years of that, said he was really getting tired of being the lonely guy of command in the seat. I think once Patrick Stewart showed up on the cover of TV Guide as TV's sexiest man, the producer said, hey, maybe we should get him a Patrick, in season three, he said the trouble with this series is the captain doesn't fight and the other F word, enough. So my episode was to get the captain uh, to, to, to lose his uh, TV virginity. Promise me you will try and stay out of trouble. I always try. There was always some tension between him and Dr. Crusher, but they never really did anything with it, unfortunately. Is he ever going to admit that he loves her? Is she going to ever admit that she secretly loves him? And he never does it. Picard's women may not have met the same tragic end as Kirk's, but Jean-Luc learned a similar lesson about the lonely life of a Starfleet commander. It still came back to the point of relationships muck things up. When you're the captain, they just get in the way. In the realm of romance, Jean-Luc could never compete with the Don Juan of hyperspace. In 178 episodes, Captain Picard hooked up with only eight women an average of one per season, while Kirk locked lips with an average of 5.25 women per season. That's an impressive 21 gals in just 79 episodes. Before long, Picard wanted some action of a different kind, but he would soon rue the day he ever left the bridge. Legend has it that Aphrodite, Greek goddess of love and desire, introduced the pomegranate to the island of Cyprus, where it was declared an aphrodisiac. And only Pom Wonderful has the juice of four whole pomegranates and is backed by modern science. Powerful then, Pom Wonderful now. Here's the truth. At all states, safe drivers can save 45% or more on car insurance. Protect your home with Allstate, too, and you can save an extra 10%. Dollar for dollar, nobody protects you like Allstate. I joined Match because it's a great opportunity to meet new people. I have nothing to lose and a lot to gain. My friends who suggested it, so I thought I'd give it a try. I joined Match to find that one great person. The world has changed. One in five relationships now begin on an online dating site. Oh, hi! hi. And when it comes to meeting someone great online, there's only one place to go, Match.com. We've led to more dates, more relationships, and more marriages than any other site. Begin something new today. How are you? Nice to meet you. Surprises are in store at Burlington. For now or under the tree, cozy sweaters, famous label boots, and festive party outfits. What's no surprise? It's all up to 70% off department store prices every day. Burlington Coat, or should I say Wow Factory. We now offer phone service for $1.70 a month with Magic Jack. That's just $19.95 a year. $19.95 a year. We give you free local and long distance and your own phone number. Make us your new phone company or add a second line with Magic Jack. As a manager, my team counts on me to stay focused, so I take one a day men's 50 plus advantage. It's the only complete multivitamin with ginkgo to support memory and concentration. Plus, it supports heart health. That's a hit. One a day men's. Attorneys have to make some tough choices, but there's one that's easy. Oasis Legal Finance is the number one choice to provide clients the money they need for bills and living expenses long before their case may settle. Oasis has prepaid millions of dollars to people just like you, with no obligation to repay if you lose your case. I need my settlement money now, but the defendant keeps delaying the court date. After my accident, I wasn't able to work, but my attorney told me about Oasis, 
and they had a check to me in two days. If you're involved in a lawsuit, call Oasis Legal Finance. Get the money you deserve. Call Oasis. Call Oasis. Whether it's money for bills, rent, car payment, or groceries, call Oasis now. Remember, the phone call is free, the application is free, and there's no obligation to repay if you lose your case. Call Oasis now. He pulled my head up, and then he took that knife and just sawed back and forth. I see the white of the, these two bones, my leg bones, and the ends are just shattered. I'm not going to go easy. I survived that night because I had to live for my daughter. I refused to die. At the helm of the next generation, Captain Jean-Luc Picard was a new kind of Starfleet commander. Calm, cool, and collected. But Picard was tired of delegating from the bridge while his subordinates saw all the action. So in the final episode of the third season, executive producer Michael Piller devised the perfect outing. The return of an inscrutable next generation nemesis, the Borg, and a plot to potentially kill off a Star Trek captain in a season ending cliffhanger. At their core, the Borg are essentially zombies. The, the attack of the living dead. Borg's motivation is simply to make everybody live their way of life. They are pure hunger. All they want is to move on to the next civilization and consume it. We wish to improve ourselves. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service ours. The Borg are the diametric opposite of what Jean-Luc Picard is. Jean-Luc Picard is always in control. The Borg's entire methodology is to subsume control. Kidnapped by Borg drones from the bridge of the Enterprise, Picard learned that resistance was, as they say, futile. The Borg were the perfect sort of foil for Picard in that they were someone he couldn't bargain with. They were someone he couldn't reason with. They were his terminator. And what they were really about as a species, as a culture, is about erasing the individual. And individualism is at the heart of Picard. When Picard is first assimilated, there's a wonderful visual effect. We just uh, we, we see his face, and in post-production, they very subtly just drain the color from the scene. And so you saw, you saw symbolically his humanity going away. <laughs> Everyone knew the Borg were scary, but in this one scene, you have Picard strapped down, helpless, out of control, totally being violated. They're taking his, uh, his soul away. Yeah. And Patrick cries this, this one tiny Single. tear, and it's so powerful. Picard, now called Locutus of Borg, became the antithesis of a Starfleet commander, an enemy of humankind. They wanted Picard to act as their voice, uh, in dealing with humanity and conquering humanity. This notion that you could continue to exist or the shell of you could continue to exist, but you would be somehow like inside your body, unable to control these horrible actions that you would then be forced to take. Um, it's horrifying to imagine that. He became a puppet, essentially, and that was the worst nightmare for any Starship captain, is to be made a weapon to be used against his crew, his world, every, you know, everything that he loved. I am Locutus of Borg. Resistance is futile. Your life, as it has been, is over. To have the sanctity of his being erased, to have his personality subsumed into this monstrous, soulless collective is the greatest horror he can imagine. In the Borg's hands, Picard's tactical skills became an instrument of evil. As Locutus, Jean-Luc led the Borg to kill 11,000 Starfleet personnel and civilians, making him deadlier than Kirk by far. But a loss for the Federation was a ratings gain for the series. The fans were still on the fence about the next generation. You know, people were used to Kirk, 
and Picard was a lot colder than Kirk. He was not a guy who let you in. So the fans didn't know how to feel. By making him a Borg, by, by leeching out all his humanity, the audience suddenly realized that he was a human being, that there was a loss there. In a, in a, in a crazy way, by making him a machine, Pillar made him human. You really didn't know what was going to happen next, and you really cared what was going to happen next, because we didn't know if we'd ever see Picard again. Picard had lost everything and won countless new fans in the process. The next generation continued for another four seasons. When the captain was at last freed from the Borg, he emerged a very different Jean-Luc Picard. After Picard's experience with the Borg, he was a different man. It's almost like the soldier who's wounded in battle and now realizes if you can get hit once, you can get hit again. Once you've taken away the illusion of invulnerability, you never get it back. He sometimes couldn't trust himself because he didn't know if he'd been fully freed from that tyranny of, of the Borg hive mind. But in Picard's newfound vulnerability, there was also acceptance, warmth, and strength. He was for so often set up as really being kind of above the rest of the crew. He was, you know, more, more, more of a, a, a king leading his people. He even made that analogy in one episode, how it, it's not easy for him to disguise himself and walk among his troops the way Henry V did. Over the course of the seven years of Next Generation being on the air was Picard going from being the monarch to the patriarch. Last scene of the finale of the series is Picard walking into the senior staff's weekly poker game. And the poker game had been around since the second season, but it was something you would never imagine Picard participating in. That was something for the crew to do. And he asked to be dealt in, and they're all shocked. That was his family, uh, in a way that it really wasn't at the beginning. And I think that was, that was the major change we saw. I should have done this a long time ago. You were always welcome. So, five card stud, nothing wild, and the sky's the limit. But the fallout from his assimilation was far from over. Picard's action as the Borg Locutus would affect his Star Trek successor in unexpected ways. Lysol believes no toilet is complete until it's completely clean. Lysol Max Coverage Toilet Bowl Cleaner gives you total coverage from rim to waterline. It even removes stains better than bleach and kills 99.9% .9 of germs. So when it comes to a healthy home, Lysol's got you covered. For tips on a healthy home, visit Lysol.com slash mission for health. Let Lysol do more for you. Check for coupons in your Sunday paper. As a manager, my team counts on me to stay focused, so I take one a day men's 50 plus advantage. It's the only complete multivitamin with ginkgo to support memory and concentration. Plus, it supports heart health. That's a hit. One a day men's. Are you ready for your talk, sir? Just going over how Geico helps people save in even more ways with good driver discounts, multi car discounts, defensive driver discounts. You! Oh, don't act like you don't recognize me. Toledo? 03? No, it's. Uh... It's too late, Stanley. Actually, miss, but my name's not Stanley. Oh. Oh, I am so sorry. From behind, you look just like him. I'm just... Well, I'd hate to be Stanley. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15%. Other handheld vacuums rely on traditional motors, whereas a Dyson handheld is powered by the Dyson digital motor. It uses neodymium magnets to spin up to five times faster than a Formula One engine. It's why Dyson handhelds can deliver twice the suction power of others. Kelly was the one who opened my eyes. She kept saying, read the label, look at the ingredients on the bag. But I thought, hey, I'm feeding my girls a big name brand. It has to be good. And then I saw chicken byproduct meal, corn gluten. Corn gluten? What's that? Real meat isn't even the first ingredient. Right. Talk about a letdown. Pet parents everywhere are finding out that many leading cat food brands aren't what they thought and turning instead to natural and delicious cat food from Blue Buffalo. 
Real meat is always the first ingredient in Blue. Plus, Blue contains whole grains, veggies, and fruit. Blue has this great thing on their website, the True Blue Test. I compared my old brand to Blue. I could not believe the great stuff in Blue that wasn't in my cat's food. And Only Blue has Life Source Bits, a blend of antioxidants and nutrients that are cold formed for greater potency. Look, when you love them like family, you want to feed them like family. That's why I feed them Blue. Don't be fooled by the big name cat food brands. Compare their ingredients to the ones in Blue and learn the truth at TrueBlueTest.com. Nobody in my family ever had a heart attack. If anything, I thought I'd get hit by a bus, but not a heart. My doctor put me on an aspirin regimen to help protect my life. Be sure to talk to your doctor before you begin an aspirin regimen. Check with your doctor, because it can happen to anybody. Which Star Trek captain was the best in battle? Answer now at Facebook.com slash bio. In 1991, Next Gen was at its peak. A hugely successful season-ending cliffhanger had earned the franchise a new army of fans, and network executives were clamoring for more. Brandon Tartikoff, who was running Paramount at the time, said, create a new Star Trek show, and it's got to be different. They looked at Gene Roddenberry's initial inspiration, Wagon Train, uh, to the stars, and they said, well, instead of wagon train, how about the Rifleman? Set in the 1880s, the Rifleman followed the exploits of a single father struggling to defend a fragile outpost in the New Mexico Territory. Deep Space Nine would transport the Rifleman to the heart of the galaxy. We didn't want to have two starship shows. Came up with the idea of a space station that was sitting in a very dangerous part of space. In 1991, months after the idea for Deep Space Nine was conceived, Gene Roddenberry, age 70, died. The news was devastating for Star Trek fans, but for those who carried his torch into deep space, it was also liberating. We always chafed a little bit, to be honest, uh, uh, against Gene's Roddenberry's stricture that, that these characters were more humane and fairer and more moral. You know, you, writers crave conflict. That's, you know, that's what drama's built on. So it was, it was a, a knife's edge we always walked. Free to create more realistic and indeed flawed characters, the creators of Deep Space Nine took Star Trek in a whole new direction, starting with the captain. For the role of Captain Sisko, we wanted a character who had recently lost his wife and was alone with his son and took on an assignment in a deep part of space at an alien space station. Alexander Sudeik was up for the role, and Rick Berman was sold that this guy was it. He saw him in some movie where he had a full beard. I guess it was a movie story of Lawrence of Arabia. There were two actors in it. One was Ray Fiennes, who played Lawrence of Arabia. And then there was a Arabic-looking actor who played the king. And he thought he was in his 40s. And come to find out, he's 24. He was so wonderful, we flew him over and we gave him the role of the doctor on the series. Siddig wasn't the only actor in the running. Gary Graham, star of the sci-fi series Alien Nation, Eric LaSalle, who would join the cast of ER, and Carl Weathers, known to Rocky fans as Apollo Creed, were all up for the most coveted captaincy in the universe. But it was Indiana-born performer Avery Brooks who stood out. It was his appearance of, as Hawk that sort of brought him to the attention of the people casting. He was a, a very uh, powerful and enigmatic uh, character in the Spencer for Hire movies that brought him to the attention of the people casting. Avery Brooks in Spencer looked so huge. <laughs> and he had such a deep voice. I think that's why they reached out and thought, well, maybe this guy could make an interesting captain. He'd be slightly different from uh, Kirk and Picard. Avery Brooks blew us away. It was, it was remarkable. The only problem? Avery's signature bald head and goatee had to go. They wanted him not to be Hawk, a character he was very identified with, and so he was asked to grow his hair out and shave his goatee. He said clearly and without any sense of quietude or gentility, I'm more comfortable looking the way I like to look and, and, and being who I am. But in the end, Avery relented. Deep Space Nine had its new captain, 
And he would be unlike any other Starfleet commander who'd come before. Right along with the fact that Deep Space Nine was going to be darker and grittier, Benjamin Sisko had flaws and dark shadows that we saw in the pilot. The first time we see Avery Brooks as Sisko in Deep Space Nine is in the pilot, in Emissary, and it's the Battle of Wolf 359, this climactic fight where the Borg cube is charging toward Earth and it's smashing apart a fleet of 39 Starfleet ships. The same battle that Picard was in in Next Generation, which was a brilliant stroke. Sisko, his ship is on fire. The Saratoga is going up in flames. His crew is dead. Everyone's trying to bail out before the ship blows up. And he's able to rescue his son, and he hands his son off to one of his crewmen, but he can't save his wife. His wife is already dead. He'd rather die than leave her behind. He was just so grief-stricken, and he just wailed this cry that just went right through you. And I remember turning to a co-worker on set. We both had tears in our eyes, and I remember thinking, this is going to be a wild ride. I thought, this is probably the most emotionally raw character I've ever seen on Star Trek. Got to go now, sir. Damn it. We just can't leave her here. Star Trek fans met a new kind of captain, embittered and unsparing. The first man to feel his wrath is the officer who gave him his commission as commander aboard Deep Space Nine, Jean-Luc Picard. He didn't see a fellow Starfleet captain. He saw Locutus. He saw the man who destroyed his ship, who killed 10,000 Starfleet officers. He saw the man who killed his wife. Picard cannot defend himself because he it's it's a burden he still carries with him. Cisco, of all the Starfleet captains we've seen as series leads, was more willing to hold a grudge. Welcome to Bajor. It's been a long time, Captain. We met before. Yes, sir. We met in battle. I was on the Saratoga at Wolf 359. You're thinking, is he gonna clock this guy right in the face? Is he gonna kill him right here and now? It's a startling moment, because we haven't seen this sort of conflict among two Star Trek heroes before. Avery Brooks, as Cisco, was able to really convey this sense that people, even in the 24th century, this perfect world, people were still not perfect. The new commander showed restraint, this time. But in 173 episodes of Deep Space Nine, Cisco let his fist do the talking 16 times, or about twice a season. In 178 episodes of Next Generation, Picard raised his voice more than his fists. He resorted to hand-to-hand -hand combat just 10 times. But even Sisko couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kirk. In 79 episodes, James T. rolled up his sleeves 83 times. But it isn't just anger that sets Sisko apart from his Starfleet peers. First of all, he's a father. You know, he, uh, he's a widower. He's lost more, in a, in a very real sense, when we meet him than any of his predecessors. Show Bible for Deep Space Nine describes Cisco as a family man. And this father-son relationship was at the core of almost everything Cisco did. Cisco and Avery had this dynamic of, uh, of being this lion who was capable of being very tender, very sweet. You hear me? I'm not going to lose you. As an outpost in the Gamma Quadrant, DS9 is visited by many species, meaning the bar on the promenade is one of the galaxy's most awesome pickup joints. But as a single father commanding an alien space station for the Federation, Cisco was in no position to play the field. He's really, for a long time, not open to any sort of romantic relationships at all, as people who lose spouses uh, often are. Ultimately, that changes when he meets the right person. What kind of reading does Captain Cisco get on our tricorder of romance? He chalks up two in the marriage column. And as for kiss and tell, zero unless you count the alternate universe where he hooks up with two different women in the same episode. Coming up, 
Star Trek's most hard-nosed captain gets an action hero makeover. With a shaved head and a goatee, you know the bad in the building. Tomorrow on Bio, spend an evening with The Man in Black. It's biography, Johnny Cash at 8 and Johnny Cash's America at 9, only on Bio. Get up close and personal with the world's most fascinating people. Go to bio.com slash shop for exclusive DVDs, books, and more. Real life, unfiltered. It's a beautiful day inside when you use Lysol Nutra Air Fabric Mist. It kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria on soft surfaces and eliminates odors at their source better than Febreze. So now a fresh home is the sign of a healthy home. For tips on a healthy home, visit Lysol.com slash Mission for Health. Be the hero of family dinner with Boston Market's all-natural rotisserie chicken, delicious sides, cornbread, and a free dessert. Just $5.99 per person. Your family feast is in the bag. Boston Market. Your table is waiting. I finally found it. It's a different kind of retinol. Tough on wrinkles, but gentle on skin. New Garnier Ultralift introduces Pro Retinol from Nature. For the first time in a moisturizer, some retinols can cause irritation. This is different. With Pro Retinol from Nature, Ultralift boosts skin's natural cell renewal, lifting wrinkles so effectively, 95% of women saw real wrinkle reduction. Smoother, younger looking. This is the skin I remember. New Garnier Ultralift with Pro Retinol from Nature. Tough on wrinkles, gentle on skin. We now offer phone service for $1.70 a month with Magic Jack. That's just $19.95 a year. $19.95 a year. We give you free local and long distance and your own phone number. Make us your new phone company or add a second line with Magic Jack. And so the killer is... <coughs> <coughs> Coughing can really be disruptive. <laughs> That's why there's Delsum. Delsum has a time-release formula that helps silence coughs for a full 12 hours. All day or all night. Up to twice as long as other cough liquids. So the only sounds you'll hear are the ones you want to hear. Constable, take her away. Delsum. Silence is relief. Hi, we're looking to save some money on our car insurance. Great! At Progressive, you can compare rates side by side so you get the same coverage, often for less. Wow, that is huge! And this is to remind you that you could save hundreds! <laughs> yeah, that'll certainly stick with me. We'll take it. Go, big money! I mean, go, it's your break, honey. Same coverage, more savings. Now that's Progressive. Call or click today. Mom, have you seen my green shirt? I can't find it. New Tide with Actilift technology helps remove many dry stains as if they were fresh. Hey, you found it. Yeah, it must have been hiding in my closet. <laughs> New Tide with Actilift. Style is an option, clean is not. Get Actilift in these Tide detergents. Deep Space Nine arrived in 1993 as a different breed of Star Trek series. Set in an alien outpost, it was far grittier than its predecessors. And that required a grittier kind of captain. They found the perfect Cisco in actor Avery Brooks, but three seasons into the series' run, Brooks decided to put his own stamp on the role in an unusual way. Cisco walks out of his office with a shaved head and a goatee. You know the bad in the building. Captain Cisco was a clean-shaven man with a full head of hair. Avery Brooks, on the other hand, was a man with a goat and a bald head. And it took us three freaking years to get the powers that be to let us shave his head and let him grow his goat. It wasn't just a change in hairstyle. The new look marked a transformation in character from a widower in mourning to a Starfleet street fighter. He had gone through a transformation, and the key to that transformation, I think, was that he finally got his own ship. He got the Defiant, 
And this is no shiny, happy ship of exploration with a hotel lounge for a bridge. This is a tight, mean, fast, overpowered battleship. This guy got himself one sweet ride. This was Cisco as he was meant to be. Captain's pips and a bad ship. And that new attitude would come in handy. As fears of domestic terrorism swept the nation in the mid-90s, Deep Space Nine and its bare-knuckle captain faced their own insurgent threat. There was one episode where he was going after Eddington, who was a uh, the security chief on Deep Space Nine who wound up, who was working for a terrorist group called the Maquis. And the new captain, Cisco wasn't about to tolerate betrayal in his ranks. Eddington betrayed him and betrayed his trust. And there's a planet on which the Maquis were using as a, um, a headquarters. And Cisco threatened to bombard it with particles that would basically make the planet uninhabitable. He's willing to become the villain if that's what it takes to defeat Eddington. You expect me to believe that a decorated Starfleet officer, the pride of the service, is going to poison an entire planet? That's exactly what I'm going to do. You're bluffing. Am I? Commander, launch torpedoes. Commander, I said, launch torpedoes. Cisco never explained his orders. He gave it, and you followed it. If you questioned it, he simply gave it to you again. Picard would discuss his orders ad infinitum ad nauseum. Picard wouldn't shut up. Kirk gave orders, you followed him. Cisco gives orders, you followed him. I know that military people that I have spoken to over the years felt that in a way he was the most believable of all the captains. Captains to captains, I think the two who are most similar are Cisco and Kirk. They're both men of action. They're very bold. What's different about them is that in a lot of ways, Cisco is more capable of morally questionable choice. Kirk, even when he wanted to cross the line, he wouldn't. He'd walk right up to the line. He would smudge the line, but he wouldn't really go across it. Cisco would get to the line, step over it, take five more steps, and say, line? What line? But even more uncharted territory lay ahead for the sci-fi franchise. Star Trek was about to surge forward by going back to the future. Paramount Studios planned to launch its United Paramount Network, or UPN, in January of 1995. And as their flagship series, they envisioned a whole new Star Trek. The next generation was nearing the end of its voyage after a successful seven-year run. Deep Space Nine was performing well. The new franchise had to be familiar, but fresh. The idea was let us find a way to take a Federation starship and fling it to the other side of the galaxy where it is in no contact with Starfleet. It's so far away, there is no logical way that it could get back. Swept into uncharted territory by an advanced but ancient technology, the USS Voyager's mission was simple, get home. But creator Rick Berman decided to add another huge twist. We decided obviously that after three males as captains, it would be great to have a female as captain. Roddenberry's vision of the 24th century was a time without color barriers or glass ceilings, but network executives and TV viewers were still living in the 20th century. Would they go for a woman captain? UPN, the new network, everybody was on board with having it be a woman, as long as everything worked out. The trouble is, everything almost didn't work out. One of my favorite I told you so experiences happened in the midst of all this. One of the actresses that came in uh, to read for the role was Jean-Vierre Bougeot. I was a huge fan of hers. She agrees to do it. They're ecstatic. The studio, the network are thrilled. We've got an Academy Award winner We're going to play our captain. This will put us on the map. But Rick Berman was hesitant. I smelled trouble because as sweet and talented as Jean Viev was, she did not strike me as somebody who could put up with the rigors of doing a television series. You're working sometimes 15, 16 hours a day. Despite Rick's warnings, Bujold arrived on set. But soon after shooting commenced, it became clear. TV was far tougher than she'd expected. Jean Viev, Bujold, uh, much more of, of a method actress 
And that's great if you have a lot of time to work with the director, you have a lot of time to work with the script, you have a lot of time to, to work with a shoot, and you're only shooting a couple pages a day. If you are shooting television, it is virtually impossible. It literally took less than 24 hours for her to come to grips with the fact that this was not for her. I was as sad as everyone else, but there was this kind of nasty sense of satisfaction that I had that this was something that I had always felt was going to be the case. Now they're like apoplectic. We've got to find something. They were ready to go back to man. They were ready to cast the first officer and doctor as women if they had to have a male captain. What's going to happen to the show now? Are we going to go in limbo? Are they going to, it's going to take forever to recast? There was this tremendous feeling of unrest. Voyager the series was set to launch in January of 1995, but just four months out, Voyager the ship was rudderless without her captain. I was sitting at a table for four with a person, and I was talking to them. Actress Rebecca De Mornay. I saw two children. As I turned to them, they sort of evaporated, like they didn't want to be seen. I did not want to tell what I just saw. Celebrity Ghost Stories. All new episodes, Saturday at 9 on Bio. <coughs> when mucus makes you cough, <laughs> it can be a long night. <coughs> Coming to the Corsa Cabana, let's dance. Oh, they're playing our song, Hacker's Delight. <coughs> Maximum Strength Mucinex DM breaks up mucus and quiets coughing. <coughs> Song's over! And only Maximum Strength Mucinex DM gets rid of mucus and quiets coughing for 12 hours. 12 hours? Mucinex in, mucus out. Last Thanksgiving, about 2 million people tried to deep fat fry their turkey. 15 succeeded in setting their houses on fire. At Christmas, there was a lot of driving over the river and through the woods and a little bit of skidding on the ice and taking out Grandma's garage door. So while you're celebrating, Allstate will be standing by. Trouble never takes the holiday. Neither should your insurance. That's Allstate stand. Are you in good hands? Overstock.com has everything you need. Designer clothes and memory foam for underneath the tree. Many gifts to choose, like housewares, rugs, and shoes. Diamond rings and lots of things that everyone can use. Oh, 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 the big, big O. Oh. Overstock.com. Buy online with ease of mind. Gifts for dad and mom. Your entire order ships for just $1. Hey, Resolve Stainbusters, our new neighbors are coming over for dinner. I vacuumed my carpet, but it's still so dingy. She needs Resolve Deep Clean Powder. It's fast and effective. Resolve gets your carpet truly clean. The moist powder penetrates deep to release trapped-in dirt left behind by vacuuming. Leaving your carpet looking like new. And it dries in only 20 minutes. It looks great. The carpet that keeps up with the Joneses. Trust Resolve. Forget stains. For tough pet stains and odors, Resolve Pet Products get your carpet truly clean. Oh, yes, this is powerful stuff. Got me circling like the moon around the sun. Mmm, hear me, this is powerful stuff. There's no way for you to give it up. It's true. Body, you never forget your first super Lots of anti-aging makeups promise results, but this one has five ingredients to prove it. L'Oreal's new Visible Lift Age Reversing Makeup. Beautiful foundation with a serum of five anti-aging ingredients, so you'll see five anti-aging benefits. It's that complete. Instantly, my skin looks luminous, flawless. And within four weeks, more even skin tone, reduced lines, and smoother skin. Five anti-aging results, one luminous makeup. New Visible Lift Age Reversing Makeup from L'Oreal. We're absolutely worth it. In 1995, the UPN TV network was set to launch a whole new Star Trek franchise. Voyager would follow the exploits of a Starfleet vessel trying to return home from the distant reaches of the galaxy. And for the first time, there wouldn't be a man at the helm. As its groundbreaking first female captain as a series lead, Star Trek Voyager cast an Oscar nominee but when she quit, the search for a replacement was kicked into warp drive. 
The fax machine went nonstop for days and days on end. Please cast a woman. Please cast a woman. Don't you dare backtrack and not cast a woman. Fortunately, one actress did have the right stuff for Starfleet. I was sitting in a movie with my best friend, Nancy Addison. She said, I'm reading something. The, the, the female captain of the new Star Trek series has just fallen out. She turned to me and she said, you would be perfect. I remember seeing uh, Kate on Ryan's Hope. She played Mary Ryan. And also Mrs. Columbo. And on uh, Roots, The Gift, she played a, a slave catcher, which is as certainly a, an interesting choice in terms of putting a woman as a slave catcher, and she played it <laughs> very, very tough. But first, she had to pass muster with the network. To land the game-changing role, Kate joined a handful of hopefuls, such as Christina Pickles, Chelsea Field, and Aaron Gray, at auditions in Los Angeles. I think I even said to the group, there must have been 30 people in that room, uh, this is really right for me, so why don't we just get going? They really wanted the first female Star Trek captain to be, you know, to be a And uh, Kate has that in space. Grew was cast on a Friday and arrived on set the following Monday to begin her first 19-hour day. I arrived at about 4.30 in the morning, and the attention to detail. I had my bosom, you know, put here and there and strapped and released and burped. I was shoved into that spandex thing. I was given four-inch boots. Everything to sort of equalize me in terms of the men. We had a hair reshoot uh, for Kate on Voyager in the pilot that I think cost $200,000 because they decided to change her hairdo. I was stopped every two minutes to fix the hair, to fix the lips, to fix the breast, to fix the thing, to fix and fix and fix and fix and fix and fix and fix. And, fix. and now, action! With so many dollars in jeopardy, it was a big deal, and I knew that we were changing television history. And so did they. And were I to fail, it would be a setback for women. But Kate kept a stiff upper lip and quickly laid claim to one of the most famous seats in television. The first time I walked down to the bridge was uh, nerve-wracking. The director said to me, you must understand that it is your living room. It belongs to you and no one else. And just take possession. And so I did. She shuffles off three or four orders real quick, she blasts them, sits down in the chair and says, engage. And I thought, oh, okay, we got our captain. I would say in battle, she's absolutely fearless. She adheres to protocol, but when necessary, she's a gunslinger. Captain Janeway kept her cool. Uh, absolute grace under pressure. You kind of never doubt it that whatever she said she was gonna do, she'd do, no matter how bad things got. And things were about to get very bad indeed. In the first episode, Janeway's leadership skills would be put to the test in the ultimate deep space dilemma. To survive, she'd have to combine Kirk's cowboy diplomacy with Picard's cunning. Voyager is a brand new ship uh, on its uh, maiden voyage. It's not a three hour tour like the Minnow in Gilligan's Island, but it's the equivalent. They're going out for a short run. And of course, uh, they're swept to the other side of, uh, of the universe. It is in the Delta Quadrant, 70,000 light years from home, where Janeway faces a choice that would change the lives of her crew and set the course for the entire series. She makes the decision to destroy the only means of getting home, the way that they were brought there, in order to prevent the bad guys from, from wreaking havoc. The prime directive is don't get involved. Leave them alone, unless something terrible is going on. <laughs> and then you go in and you try to fix it. Janeway is forced with an incredible uh, dilemma. She knows what the right thing to do is uh, morally and ethically, but that course of action is going to cost her and her crew dearly. As a captain, you have to make those choices that only the captain could make. We'll have to find another way home. What other way home is there? 
Who is she to be making these decisions for all of us? She's the captain. She was in probably one of the most extreme situations of any Starfleet captain. Kirk and Picard are very close to home when they're on their various missions. If something goes really bad, some, another ship can come out and help them. Voyager is on their own. There's no backup. There's no help coming. In a moment of perilous decision, there has to be a recklessness to it. There has to be a fearlessness to it. Logic will not provide you with the answer. So when push came to shove, she pulled her guns out. And she just went firing into the abyss. And nine times out of 10, it saved the day. Fire. Once you had to throw all reason out the window, she was the one with the samurai sword. Come on, come on. And that's what I think defined Catherine Janeway. Get your phasers, get your stun rifles, let's go. I mean, I was the first one always to want to jump on the shuttlecraft. Is Kate right? Was Janeway first to leave?